Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with me today. As you know, several of you have had several requests, and so I'm be, I will be dealing with at least two topics today. But let me first introduce you to Ryan and Kelly Petty. I first met Ryan whenever we were both appointed to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission, and the result the reason for the commission and the reason we got to meet was because their beautiful 14-year-old daughter, Elena, was tragically murdered at Marjorie Sturman Douglas on February the 14th, 2018. So shortly after that horrible event, I met Ryan and Kelly, and we have grown to be great friends. In fact, they moved from Broward County to Polk County and they have agreed to be with us today. The questions that I've received are about the horrible tragedy of the shooting in Texas, where once again an elementary school was shot up and children died and school teachers died. And I can tell you that I'm mortified, I'm heartbroken, I think but for the grace of God, it could have been any one of us and our children or grandchildren, and it has been for uh, Kelly and Ryan. I've also stopped speculating or not speculated because the initial information that comes out, and as you all know, you're in the news business, is piecemeal and suspect at best, and the validity of it, you know, we can never be sure of. It normally takes a week or so for everything to calm down until you get at least a trend of what's accurate. But what I do know is I watched the press conference like many of you did, where the spokesman clearly and unequivocally said the doors weren't locked. And he was in the school for an hour before they neutralized the threat. That is unacceptable. So I have agreed to speak and give you some direction on what I believe should have happened based on the best information I have and the training that we have. Once again, Governor Rick Scott was in office at the time when the horrible shooting occurred and within three weeks because the legislative session was in progress, we had the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Law, and it required a lot of things. Most of the things that it required, quite frankly, in Polk County, we were already doing. I have worked closely with the school system, in, at, and in fact, I've contracted some of my people. I'm in charge of the safe schools. We have this philosophy here, and the philosophy is simply this. When you take your children to school, healthy and well in the morning. You have every right and expectation to receive them back in the afternoon in the same healthy state that you delivered them to school in the morning. I took three of my grandchildren to school this week after that horrible tragedy. And as they walked onto campus, I saw a guardian. I saw police officers because their schools are in the city. And why is that? It's because the legislature in Florida and the governor acted. But I always say this, and I underscore this. The last school district in the state of Florida to come into compliance was the Broward County School District. Did you hear what I said? Where the shooting took place, we as a commission and later on through a grand jury, had to force Broward County to do some things that they should have. And we had varying amounts of trouble on the commission getting other school districts to comply with state law. So why do I say all of that? Quite frankly, because I'm not surprised with that police response. It was a very small community in a very rural part of the state. And what we find overwhelmingly still today, after Columbine, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, 
Parkland, and to name just a few, people are in denial. It can't ever happen here. I will say this, and quite frankly, I hope you can prove me wrong, but the overwhelming majority of the school districts in this country, the overwhelming majority of law enforcement agencies in this country are not equipped and trained to deal with an active assailant, an active shooter, to the level that they need to be. And you can always improve. So I wasn't surprised that the doors were unlocked. I wasn't surprised. I was saddened about the response. Let me tell you clearly and unequivocally, the training in Florida, and I'll speak specifically here, and I'm thankful for the Florida legislature. I'm thankful for the people of the state of Florida and the support. But if you come to a school in this county armed, we're going to do our best through either our guardians, our school resource officers, or our school resource deputy sheriffs to eliminate the threat outside of the school before they ever get to the children. We're trained to do that. Now, if you have trouble understanding that, let me give it to you in Polk County vernacular. This is the last thing you'll see before we put a bullet through your head if you're trying to hurt our children. We are going to shoot you graveyard dead if you come onto a campus with a gun threatening our children or shooting at us. Now, quite frankly, here's the deal. We're going to charge directly to the threat. There's no mustering. There's no gathering up. We go individually to the threat and engage it. That's what we train for. Why do we train like that? If they're shooting at us, they're not shooting at the children. Now, we don't want to be shot either, but given the choice of being shot and killed on the ground or those children dying, we'll die every time. When you turn your children over to us at the schools, they are our children all day long. And that's how we respond. That's how our training responds. Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, an hour until they engage the shooter, that is absolutely unequivocally unacceptable. But you have to train for that. You have to have the equipment immediately. You have to work at pushing through. It's hard to run into gunfire. If you've never had that opportunity, and the world hasn't, I can tell you, it's not fun. I have been there way back in the day. It wasn't fun then. It's not fun now. It's not supposed to be fun. But we're going in and eliminating the threat, period. When somebody starts as an active shooter, they're an active shooter. Just because they're shooting pauses doesn't let them off the hook. We're going to protect the schools, the businesses. But let me underscore this denial issue, folks. When the threat is there and you dial 911 on that cell phone, we're too late. We know by studying and research, the average police response is plus five minutes. The average shooter is zero to five minutes. Just look at the numbers. When seconds count, minutes don't make any difference. I'm grateful for the legislature. I'm grateful that they passed the legislation for the Guardian program. I'm going to turn the podium over to my friend, Ryan Petty, and I'm going to let him say what's on his heart because as bad as it is, he and Kelly are the subject matter experts here. Oh, by the way, Ryan went through our guardian training 
because he wanted to audit it and see if he believed it met the standards and the requirements to keep children safe. And I'll let him talk about that. And the Guardian program emanated from our Sentinel program that I had put in place years before and offered to the public schools, offered to the state colleges, and offered to the private colleges. Only the private colleges took me up on it. But after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, they took my Sentinel program, added 12 hours to it, and inculcated it in Florida law, and it's now the Guardian program. Right? Thank you, Sheriff. Um, you know, I, I've been pretty vocal on social media the last few days about the tragedy that uh, we're learning more about each day in Uvalde, and my heart goes out to uh, the families of the victims. I've watched the video. Uh, I've watched the failures, and my heart breaks. It would appear, and again, Sheriff Judd is right, and these things take time. It took us months on the MSD Commission to understand what happened in Parkland and where the failures were and how to address those failures. But I can tell you the simple act of locking that door at that school, all of those kids and those teachers might be alive today. And law enforcement could have addressed that threat outside of that school building, outside of that classroom. It's the little simple things, like locking doors, that can make all the difference. And it's heartbreaking to know how easily he got onto that campus and into that classroom. Now, we may never know exactly why he chose that school as a target, because he's no longer with us anymore. Because eventually, after an hour or more, tactical team went in and did what should have been done immediately. They took out the threat and they stopped the killing. But my, my belief is he chose that elementary school because he was a student in that school district and he understood that the elementary schools did not have school district police officers on campus. He knew that that school would be unarmed and unable to respond. We'll have to wait for the investigation to unfold to figure out whether or not I'm right. But my guess is he picked it because he knew it was a soft, easy target. So let's talk about the Guardian program for just a moment. One of the things that's very different about Florida than what, what we see in Texas, and my understanding is only 30% of the districts in Texas allow their teachers and staff to be armed on campus. And I still don't know to this day whether Uvalde Independent School District is one of those districts or not, but my belief is they aren't. The guardians are that last line of defense. And as the sheriff mentioned, you know, and, and the best case, law enforcement is going to get to the scene of those, these horrific tragedies after several minutes. The killing's over by the time responding law enforcement gets there. In fact, Secret Service study of school attacks sh showed that of 42 attacks, they studied 42 attacks, only one was stopped by responding law enforcement. And that was because they were actually there on campus that day doing a drug sweep. It's too late for responding law enforcement to get to these killers. The kill they're already doing their heinous deed. So um, we need guardians. And the sheriff said, I went through that guardian training because I wanted to understand for myself. I want to be able to stand in front of the people in the state of Florida and say with 100% ass assurance, I know the training is good. I know the training um, is effective. And I would be happy to send my kids to a school that had guardians in that school because I went through with a group of teachers, and I'm not going to say which school they belong to, and I'm not going to give out names or anything like that, but I know they're prepared and ready and willing to run to the threat and take out the threat, and they're capable of doing that. 
So I will, I will leave it at that. We'll see how the investigation in Uvalde uh, unfolds over the next several days. There's a lot to learn, but I think uh, if I could offer some advice to that law enforcement agency, Sheriff, it would be they need to be very clear about what they know and what they don't know, and what they don't know they shouldn't be guessing in front of, in front of the public at this point. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Sheriff. You know, it's interesting when you look that is a very large county with a very small population. Normally, small communities with small police departments have small funding. But at the end of the day, the training is what makes the difference. And quite frankly, we can never, never guarantee that there will never be another active shooter, active assailant. But if we do things that cost virtually nothing, locking the doors, everything we do lowers the probabilities of success for the active shooter. So what we're trying to do is lower the probabilities of one, it occurring, and two, them being successful, and three, if somebody is injured, we're able to quickly mitigate it before more people are injured or killed. So with that, we'll take any questions you have on this topic. Certainly. We, we always receive calls about what can I do, what can I do, what can I do. Now this may seem the inappropriate time. I suggest it's the perfect time. Why don't you come be a law enforcement officer? Why don't you put yourself where your mouth is? There's very few law enforcement agencies in this country that are full staffed because of the environment today. You know, we had the hate on the cops and the defund the police. That was pretty cool. I watched all around the nation, these places wanting to defund the cops. At the same time, the cops were standing in the gap between good and evil to protect them and keep them safe. Well, that's just crazy talk by crazy people. But we need help. In the state of Florida, every public school, every charter school has either a guardian a law enforcement officer, either a sheriff's deputy or a police officer on the campus. Come join us. Be a guardian. We'll train you. We'll pay you. Be a law enforcement officer because even if you're not protecting a campus at that moment in time, law enforcement officers are out here standing between good and evil and protecting you every day. So come do it. That's how we can make a positive difference. That's how we can change. So, Sheriff, you mentioned that small counties have small funding, uh, and, but obviously there's merit to you know, single entry campuses, video verification when somebody comes in, having a guardian. Would you like to see, and maybe Kelly's could comment on this too, about would you like to see a federal mandate funding to support that? Well, there has been grant money available, and there is some grant money available. But what we have to see first is we have to see a society, a community that stands up together and goes, hey, you know, this is real. You know, the statistical probabilities of your child ever being hurt in a school shooting are minuscule. But numbers don't matter when it's your child. And I tell my staff and our guardian staff, and that's what we say all across the state of Florida, we prepare every day for the horrible thought that there may be an active shooter, and we pray that there's not one. We don't want that. Even with our best training, even if we find them in the parking lot, even if we stop the threat in the parking lot, that's not what we want. We want the people, when they see something or hear something, they say something. We want to find this active assailant back when they're doing their crazy talk on social media or telling their neighbor or their new best friend. We want to intervene. Now what you don't see and what we're not going to talk about, every school district in this state and probably in this nation intervene multiples of times every year. We do. Thank God when you get to the bottom of it, 
It's a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 16-year-old doing just stupid talk. That it's not for real. But we accept everyone on face value as a valid threat until we're able to deal with it otherwise. Because we don't know who is just mad and chattering on social media and who means what they say. So if you say it, we take that you mean it. And we want intervention. So we have layers of intervention. The schools are required to do a lot more detailed risk analysis. We have mental health services. And we're still working to make those more robust. We've not finished, we're not at the end game with security in the state of Florida. But we're light years ahead of most places in the United States. That doesn't mean that we can't have an active shooter. We just pray that we've reduced the probabilities. Because a madman with a gun is a dangerous person. Mr. Petty, would you like to see a federal mandate for a guardian program? Um, I, I agree with what the sheriff said. I mean, when, after Parkland, I went up uh, and lobbied um, for the Stop School Violence Act, and we got that passed immediately after. And there was a billion dollars worth of funding for school hardening projects and things like that. Um, I'd love to see more funding for it. Uh, the complaint I hear from school districts sitting on the State Board of Education is we don't have enough funding for, you know, any, any, almost anything, they say, right? So um, more funding would be good. I, I typically don't like to see the strings that get attached uh, from D.C. To these, uh, to these funding things, but if there were block grants and, uh, and the funding would be used for guardians, then I would support that. So, and I don't know if you saw the video, but you both you probably speak to this better than anyone. Uh, the video I saw was part of the thing that there were parents outside of that school who were begging them to go in, who were insisting to go in. Uh, I believe one woman was arrested for trying to go in. What do you think of that? Uh, I, I've learned to be careful because video doesn't always show all of the context, but that video made me angry. And I want to know what was going on out there. There was a lot of law enforcement standing outside that school, and it took an hour to stop this threat. Now, we've heard that most of the killing happened in the first few minutes, but we don't know that yet. And there could have been kids in that classroom that were still alive that needed for a first responder to reach them. And uh, I, look, it's pretty clear the response was atrocious. And so we'll see. We'll see what, what uh, the Texas DPS say today. But um, my heart goes out to those parents. I just can't believe what I was seeing. Couldn't believe it. Sheriff, do you feel the same way when you originally initially heard it? Once again, and I'll reiterate what I said, what Mr. Petty has said, some of this information is still not accurate, but I think they pretty well nailed down the response was an hour. And that was 59 minutes and 59 seconds too slow. It's unacceptable. It's horrible. We challenge our deputies in training, how fast would you run in there if that were your child? That's how fast you have to run in there for all children, for all teachers. And you know what? They do. We have real simunition training where to the extent that when we're in training, we use school classrooms when they're out, out of class. And we have actors that are children, that are adults, that are dressed up as law enforcement or, or law enforcement officers, laying down so they have to, our deputies have to step over their dead bodies to engage the threat. We, we try, we try, we try to train so that they'll understand you can't stop here. 
this person shot. You've got to go stop them from shooting the next one. And our prayer is that we're back here dealing with this person. If you see something, hear something, say something. At that point, you can knock on their door and they'll open it to you. And they're not in a rage with a gun and shooting. But at the end of the day, we train and we train and we train and you have to. But the number one issue is the community, the school systems, the, and some law enforcement agencies in denial. It's not going to happen here. Well, I pray it doesn't. But The, the morning we watched Columbine on television, long before I was the sheriff, when I was a commander here, I looked at my colleagues and I go, we quit staging this moment. And you must understand that law enforcement officers, by their nature, want to serve and they want to protect and they want to keep people safe. But you react to your training and there has to be robust training and significant training and some places can't afford it and don't. It's a little bitty community and they think it'll never happen here. Well, newsflash, let me take you back. When somebody will shoot up babies in a one-room schoolhouse in Amish country, out in the country, when you can be a victim of an active assailant there, you can be an active assailant victim any place. So at the end of the day, it takes, a, it takes training, and it takes muscle memory, and it takes dedication. It, it is hard. You have to force yourself with all the training to push through. And I suggest that most places just don't think it will happen. Listen, let me underscore it one more time because I'm still in shock. After the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas massacre, after the law was changed in Florida, we still had to force school districts to comply and Broward was the last one to come into compliance. What does that tell you? We as a nation got to get our mind right first. And not expect, but demand of their school systems that they lock the doors, that they have safe zones. Demand of their police agencies and the sheriff's offices that they have the right equipment and training there now to engage. That's when it's going to change. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm glad you asked that question about do we need stricter gun laws. Well, let me suggest this. There was a law against murder in Texas that day. Did they pay attention to that law? There was a law in Texas against bringing firearms onto a school campus that day. Did they pay attention to that law? There was a law against use of a firearm in the commission of a felony. Did they pay attention to that law? The legislators all run to the podium and they start playing politics. Well, shame on you. Shame on you. And I tell folks, if we had this giant magnet and we could scoop every gun from the whole universe away. Let me take you back to Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma. Then you just go down and get you some fertilizer and have a bomb and blow the place up. It's not the instruments. It's the person. It's the deranged person. Then I heard... Well, you know, there's mental health issues. Well, duh, normal people don't do this. So when they start screaming, more laws, more laws, more laws, we got plenty of laws. That's not the issue. The issue is evil, deranged human conduct, and overwhelmingly, almost without exception, 
there's always been cues in advance of the shooting that people ignored. That's what's got to change. Because the last place we want to stop it is in a classroom. The next to the last place we want to stop it is in the parking lot. Where we want to stop it is when somebody sees something or hears something and say something and we can put interventions in place. And that happens sometimes. We can't tell you how many active shooters in the state of Florida we've stopped or how many has been stopped across this nation because of good police procedure, because of people who cared, because you can't measure the absence of something. We can only show you the ones that end up like Texas did. Sheriff, would you be willing to, are you, are you in the process or are you thinking about sharing your plans with the Guardian program to other uh, police districts across the country just to kind of, I mean, you have a good Sure. Most importantly, understand that there are a massive number of professional police, law, police agencies, law enforcement agencies all over this nation. We share ideas and plans and tactics. Virginia Tech did some remarkable work after the shooting. Sandy Hook did some remarkable work after the shooting. Parkland did some remarkable work after the shooting. After the shooting's too late. But yes, sir, we have it and we do share information. And not only will we share information, we'll go there and teach it or bring people here and teach it. We share it. We want to do everything we can. I'm as, I am as excited to help a school district, a police agency, save a child from Alaska, Wyoming, California, New York, pick the state from dying as I am here. I don't want any children to die. And we'll, we always are, are excited about that. And we do. So when, when I, we stand up as Mr. Petty and I have today, it's not lost on us that there are a lot of remarkably trained police agencies. I'm just telling you, the majority of the agencies in this nation aren't the Los Angeles PD, the New York PD, the, the Atlanta and Miami PD. It's very small agencies. The majority of the police agencies across this nation are very small. Some of the very small ones are very well trained, but I'm suggesting most aren't. Not because they don't want to, they can't afford it, or they don't realize the threat because it's a very close-knit community where they know everybody. Other topics? You're, sure. You ready to go on to another topic? Sure. Yes. Yeah, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, our lady who made a McMess at the McDonald's with her violent, out-of-control conducts got her an attorney. I call him the McLawyer. And that's what McLawyers say because they defend their clients and they're supposed to. But let me underscore clearly and unequivocally, I wouldn't have been up there talking about her mech rant and her mech rage and her mech criminal conduct if she, she, number one, hadn't have done it. She created the environment. And then she showed us her belly bump and twerked out, and we were looking for her to find her. So get used to it. Well, you know, lawyers say lots of things. That's what they're paid to do. And quite frankly, everybody needs a good criminal defense attorney that's charged with criminal conduct. So, but, you know, it's what's important to understand here. He's got an opportunity to get a lot of free publicity. So, so good for him. Any concern ever about jury pools? 
look, I can't get people interested in active shooters. Do you think anybody's going to pay any attention to a press conference today and a jury trial a year or two or three years down the road? That's nonsense. Everybody knows that except those that are making public statements. But our McCriminal has a McLawyer, and we're going to McCourt. Okay? When you go to McCourt, do you think that the felony charges will stick? The, it, is, it is normal for there to be plea negotiations. Very few cases go to trial straight up. So we file the criminal charges based upon the conduct we see and how it violates the law. That's probable cause. That's this level. Cases then have to be proven beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. That's this level. Now, sometimes victims decide a year down the road they're over it. Sometimes witnesses' memories fade. Sometimes evidence doesn't substantiate what it appeared at the beginning. But I'd say we have a pretty darn good video of her Mick rant and her Mick rage and her Mick criminal conduct. So what the state attorney files or what they plead down to is just part of the process and we'll cool with it. You can't really say her client, but this woman had mental issues because of her pregnancy. She couldn't take her medication. Would that have changed anything about the way you doesn't that sound like a excuse to you? Oh, she's got mental health issues. She's pregnant. You know, you know. I, I just got to tell you, I, I lived with a lady that had two babies. You know, my wife, and you know, they're delicate. You got to be sweet to them. You got to be kind to them. I mean, heck, I think her mama was trying to buy her a milkshake. And she was a McTorkin around and tearing stuff up. That's, that is all McGarbage. You know, that's just a Mick excuse for conduct. She went in when they're trying to fix her order. And they said, we'll fix your order. We'll give you your money back. And she went Mick nuts. Who's that on? It's not on McDonald's. It's on her. You know, but she's got an attorney, and God bless her, she needs one. I think I know the answer to this question, but would you change anything you said back in the original press conference? McNo. Thank you for the insight. <laughs> if I didn't mean it, I wouldn't have said it to begin with. And by the way, we found her. She turned it herself in after that. I mean, she's the one that went on the Mick run. She's the one that hid after she committed the criminal conduct. We wouldn't have had near as much to talk about in a press release if she hadn't have been running. Now, it worked. We got people's attention. She went to jail. So we got a Mick arrest. Have I met your expectations? Thank you. See y'all later. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Be safe. Remember those who fought and died so we could have a free democracy.